you stuck around this far, thank you very much. And uh, we've got some really, really exciting stuff to show you guys with this and the next presentation where we're really happy to finally get to talk about a lot of the stuff that we've been cooking up for a while at the same time as all those Hermes releases. Uh, so this is our chief scientist, Bowen Peng. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he's really that guy. He really is that guy. Yeah, without further ado. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. The GitHub internet went out. <laughs> okay, we're good. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. So, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Bowen. I'm the chief scientist here at News Research. And today I go I'm going to give a talk on distributed training, right? That's what everyone's so excited about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the future of scaling, actually. Um, oh, sorry. So let's start with uh, Neural Network's humble beginnings. So it was actually this guy, like Frank, uh, Frank Rosenblatt. He made the Perceptron an uh, actual physical uh, neural network, like connected by wires and trained using um, actual analog motors. So they showed like pictures of shapes. Uh, one by one to the machine, <laughs> the magic, magic black box. And then it could <laughs> tweak using um, analog motors, using like back propagation. And they trained a 20K physical param sized one hidden layer neural network. And it was trained to recognize basic shapes like triangles, like A, B, like some character recognition. It wasn't very accurate. so. After this experiment, basically people discredited neural networks for a long time, right? There was um, a real like, AI winter for 40 years, basically. Um, and then what happened in 2012? Suddenly, like, some, a team of, uh, of uh, a student, uh, Alex Krisky at, uh, uh, I forgot where he was at, actually. But, uh, in 2012, they just said, oh, we have GPUs, right? We have CUDA. Why don't we just try a huge neural network, huge, in quotes, 64 million parameters, and just train it on two GPUs for five days? So they actually just trained a 12 million image training set on two RT uh, GTX 583 GB GPUs for five days, and they beat every other competitor by 10% on the 2012 ImageNet large-scale visual recognition challenge, right? So this was the first hint to everyone that maybe uh, the architecture isn't what's important. It's actually scale, the scale of training data and neural networks. And from this uh, day on, onwards, you have this scaling explosion, right? This is from Epoch AI. And this uh, AlexNet, you see it's here, uh, 10 exponent tw uh, 18. And then today we're at GPT-4, Gemini Ultra. That's 10 exponent 26. So that's like a few, <laughs> it's a lot more bigger, right? 4.1 times every year. So now we're at uh, trillions of parameters. This is uh, what's powering all the AIs right now. So why is scaling so difficult? Why can't we just go to 10 trillion, one, one quadrillion, right, <laughs> size models? Actually, one of the biggest uh, limiting factors of scaling is chip defects. So when, uh, who, who, does anyone here work in like chip manufacturing or anything? <laughs> no one? Uh, chip defects actually uh, are the biggest limiting factors because when you have defects, random dots in the, in the silicon, they break the die, they break the, uh, the actual chip. So if you see you have smaller dies on the left, you have a higher yield, you have more good dies. While if you have A100s, uh, a lot of the dies are just broken, so you, you have, a, you, you earn less, you, you have less dice. And H100s are bigger, B100s are even bigger, right? So as you scale up this um, scaling, everything becomes more expensive. There's also cooling, the same problem. So how do you cool the center of the chip? It will just melt, right? If you made a one meter square meter chip, the middle will just melt. And same thing with power distribution. How do you get the power to the middle of the chip? That's really hard. So if you make, like, if you stack chips in 3D, right, people are starting to stack, make 3D chips, how do you get the power to the center? That's a, it's a problem of a square cube law, right? So as you scale up, the chips bigger and bigger, they just fail. They just cannot be scaled anymore. It's more and more ex expensive, right? So, so the solution is distributed training. So you have more GPUs just produce 
uh, millions of GPUs, right, and train the network. So then what's the problem? That's actually the holy grail of scaling up because you don't have this uh, cooling problem. You can just cool every GPU individually and you can distribute the power, right? You can give power to all the GPUs in different data centers, whatever. So if you split the work across multiple devices, that's called distributed training. And NN training, neural network training, is massively parallel. It's inherently massively parallel. So there's technically no issues for training. So why is it a problem, right? Why is it plagued with issues? And why is it so expensive? So let's talk about the first type of data, uh, uh, first type of parallelism, like training. It's called data parallelism, DP. So there's other names for it. There's DDP, there's zero, and there's FSDP. So all of those are variants of data parallelism, which just simply, put it simply, is copying the model into multiple GPUs and giving them different data, right? So let's say you have four GPUs, so you put the model on the four GPUs and give them each a different book to train on. And after this uh, training step, you just average everyone back together, right? That's the obvious way. And this compute scales perfectly linearly because as you add more GPUs, you can give more data, it trains faster, right? But the problem is that now you can see when you average all the models together, you, the communication costs are more and more expensive as you add more GPUs. So if you have 64 GPUs, you have to communicate the model size, the weights 64 times, right? across every GPU, so it's 64 squared. And if you go to 108, that's even bigger and bigger and bigger. And NVIDIA actually uh, uses like tree, uh, tree topologies or ring topologies to alleviate this issue, but it still grows like unbounded. Like basically, as you grow the amount of GPUs, it becomes so expensive. Uh, the problem with also with DP is that the model must fit entirely in each accelerator node. So the GPU has to be very big, basically, enough VRAM. So if you don't have the VRAM, you can't use data parallelism. There's currently two like potential uh, solutions to this problem of the um, communication cost. There's DLOCO and what we are going to present, also Distro. The second uh, parallelism method is MP, model parallelism. This one is less of a like parallel, it's more kind of sharding, so this allows you to train bigger models. So what you do is you split the model into smaller parts, and you assign each GPU to the part of each model, right? So you can either split the data, so you train faster, or you split the model so that you can fit a bigger model on the GPUs. Here, the communication, communication costs are much, much smaller, because then you're only transferring the single layer, the data, from one layer to the next. and one problem is that as you split more and more, it becomes slower and slower because if every GPU has to wait for the next one, right? So in pipeline parallelism, so that's the, the bottom one, uh, every GPU needs to wait somewhat for the previous one, right? As it trains forward and the backward pass, same thing. Uh, for tensor parallelism, which is the second one, every, uh, it's actually limited by the, lowest, uh, the slowest GPU because every GPU is training on like it's um, slicing the model like in vertical. So the slowest GPU would bottleneck the, um, the training run. Solutions, there's Dipaco and Swarm, which are two methods of achieving model parallelism across the internet. So if we are focused on DP today, like data parallelism, let's just start with DLOCO, right? Um, DLOCO is actually very simple. It's really, really simple. Well, what you do is that during training, usually you train one step and then you average all the models together, right? You average the gradient. Um, in DLOCO, what you do is you train each model in each GPU individually, uh, like for each number of steps, which it's called inner steps. And then after those inner steps, you do an average afterwards. That's called an outer step. So here you can see, the, the, this is from the paper, they trained the model on like five different, four different GPUs on in like four countries, and then they trained that for each intercept, let's say 50 steps, and then the outer optimization then averages everyone together. And this reduces the communication requirements by N over H, right? Because uh, it divides by H, where N is the total amount of training steps, and H is the intercept. But ha here is one problem is that this is amortized uh, communication analysis, right? So after the H amount of intercept, you have a big, like, like again, like a 50 gigabyte transfer for every GPU, right? Which 
basically is almost impossible to do over the internet. Like if one person disconnects <laughs> during this 50 gigabyte transfer, like just everything breaks. Uh, the second problem is that this is two optimizers. We have the inner and the outer, which is really difficult to tune. So the last thing is distro. So this is the latest optimizer that we've created. Uh, what it does in, like, in general fashion is that we let each accelerator node train independently. So if you think about copying the model over many GPUs, right? All of those GPUs have the same model usually with uh, traditional training. But why should it be? Why should every GPU have the same model? Is there a, like, a law of nature that must be like, like that? We thought, no, probably not, right? That's an assumption that we had from previous um, training methods. So let's, let's just assume, let everyone train independently, never synchronize, just they all train independently, then you have a very slow training basically, right? Because everyone's seeing the data divided by the amount of nodes. So if you have 64 nodes, everyone's seeing 64 times less data per uh, step. And that's a problem. Uh, so the, to solve this, we try to pull everyone back together so that they stay in the same as close as possible. So if you have more bandwidth, you can pull everyone more. So if you um, actually have infinite bandwidth, this is exactly the same as ADAM training because you just pull everyone to a single point with the maximum bandwidth you can. But if you have little bandwidth, so let's say one megabyte of, tr of, of bandwidth per step, then you can just pull them a little bit, right? With, uh, as far as possible with that bandwidth. And what we've shown in the, in the preliminary report is that we can basically do 800 times reduction in bandwidth without even harming the training. So this is the, the training run we did on a 1B uh, LLM. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A 800 times reduction and both, basically both uh, loss curves are identical, right? Um, here's the equation. So basically you have the standard uh, optimizer step, which is the training before the plus, and then you have a regularization uh, term which is tries to pull every node back together. And we'll show you all the details in the paper that will come in, in the next uh, following weeks. And if you want to look at the preliminary report, here's the, um, the report on GitHub. So what comes next, right? We can have a small discussion on like decentralized training, right? Uh, distributed is the first step. And decentralized could be the second step where you don't have a centralized coordinator where everyone can just train anything by themselves, right? You wouldn't need someone, a failure point, a central failure point. There's also federated learning where right now we have a huge data problem. Who, who has access to the, meta, the, the llama data? No one, right? Who has access to the Mistral data? No one, except them. But we can, uh, with federated learning, we can actually pull everyone's data, like everyone's data using uh, federated learning and train a SODA model, right? That's the, that's the dream of federated learning. Um, there's also other stuff like zeroth order training, which allows you to train without back propagation. That could be a very interesting future where as you do inference, you can train the model at the same time. It's less efficient, but as you scale more inference uh, more and more, because OpenAI actually right now uses more compute to do inference than, than, uh, than training. So they could potentially use the inference time, uh, all the data from the inference to train their models, right? There's also societal and environmental impacts and democratization of AI because we don't want AI to be centralized into rich and powerful entities. We can want AI to be <laughs> able to be used by everyone, right? Imagine one day if there's some regulatory thing that prevents Mistral and Llama to release uh, Open Model ever again. What would we, what we would do? No, we can't release anything, right? So then with this rule, we could potentially train together a, a SOTA, like really, really large one trillion models, um, LLM, or even diffusion models. There's also like, arguments for safety, but I won't get <laughs> too much into it. Uh, I, I, I guess you guys are already pretty tired. Here's the Discord. Join the Discord to, uh, for collaboration. And thank you for everyone. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh,